Hey guys, today's uh, video is going to be a little bit different because I'm going to be, and I hope that you can hear me okay, I know that some people were commenting on other videos that my volume wasn't that great, so um, I hope that you can hear me okay on this one, and if not, I'm so sorry about that. Just turn your volume up a little bit more and we'll just do, go with it like that. So today's video is going to be a little bit different because I am actually going to be sharing my screen with you and we're going to be going over a book that I've been reading. And I'm not going to be reading the whole book with you, of course, but I, I do encourage you to go out and get the book or read it. And I'll leave the link in this description if I remember. If not, please leave a comment below and remind me to leave the link there if it's not in the description. Um, and this book, I believe, is completely free on Google Playbooks. Um, and so I'll be giving you guys the name of this book soon so you can follow along or start reading if you will or if you want to. So it's going to be a little different because I have been really enjoying this book and you guys don't know this about me, but I am an avid reader. Like I read all the time. I read nonfiction. I read uh, fiction. I read self-help personal development books. I read a lot of Christian books. I read a lot of Christian nonfiction books. I read a lot of historic books and I read a lot of the Bible. So I wanted, I really wanted to start this new like series, if you will, where I am just going over a religious text with you here. And I don't really like using the term religious text because it makes it sound like it's religious. And I don't really like to subscribe to religion, but more so having a relationship with God and the Father. But um, of course, the genre, if you will, that these books and forms of literature will fall into is religious text. So um, I'm just calling it that just for the sake of that. But I'm really excited to see where this goes with you guys. And if you like these type of videos after kind of tuning in, please let me know in the comments and I'll do more like these. Really um, what it's going to be is me sharing my screen with you and going over some of the, some of the most prominent or cool things or very interesting things or thought-provoking things that stood out to me in the books that I read. Today we're going to be focusing on one particular book and I think it's pretty interesting because on Google Playbooks and also if I'm on the Bible Gateway website it allows you to highlight certain words and sentences or passages within the literature, the, the writing, and write your own notes within that. And so that is going to be really, really cool for these type of videos because I can just go back to the sentences or the passages or, you know, particular words and click on it and review my notes that I wrote on that. So that's going to be really cool. Also, my quality in this video looks a little bit grainy because I'm actually using a different software to be able to share my screen with you guys. So bear with me on the quality and bear with me on the um, the audio and we'll just go with, we'll just go with it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with, well, first I'll share with you the name of the book and it's called God's, God's Trial by Fire of Wood, Hay and Stubble and it's by Walter Rosen. The book was actually written I think in the 1800s, like the late 1800s and um, I'm putting that out there because a lot of the language and a lot of how this is written, it's very dated. So, you know, it can be kind of a hard read, but, you know, I just am a firm believer in asking the Holy Spirit to guide you through religious texts so that you can understand what's being said and read the fruit that is possible. So I'm gonna share my screen with you guys really quick. you can see. Okay, so I hope that you can see my screen. And I really hope that this is working the way I want it to. If not, then that'll be really bad, but ugh, how to crack my neck. Cool. So um, again, the title of this book is God's Trial by Fire, Wood, Hay, and Stubble, and you can, you can get it on the Google, uh, play.google.com, and you just type in the title, and it'll come up there, and it's completely free, and I'm also going to try to do a lot of, like, 
breakdowns of books that are free that you can find so that way you don't have to pay for them. I will try. Uh, so I'll leave the link below if you want to follow along. So I am on page four, this book. Um, of course, I started it from page one. I think I'm on page like 70 right now, but I'm going to go through some of the notes that I've already left. So the first note that I made was on page four, and I'll read to you the sentence following up to that. And it says, um, but saying, Lord, I believe, why? By an immediate lapse of faith in God's promises to believers, why lay thyself open to the future rebuke? O oh, thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? A believer in Christ should not be with, Lord, save me forever on his lips. For that indicates coexisting with Lord, I believe, faith doubting God's pledged word, afraid to take the salvation preferred, faith in a sinking condition. So I'm going to break down to you exactly what this, saying, this is saying, because I know that because this text is extremely dated, it's hard to understand right off the top what he means. But really what he's saying is, if you truly believe in God and you truly have faith, never, ever should it come out of your mouth. Lord, help me especially when it comes down to um, a certain situation that you're going to. And he's come, he's not coming from a place of saying, like, you should never ask God from, for help. But he's saying, you know, the first thought in your mind should be that God knows your situation and he's going to help you. And I wrote a note here, and um, I just put really, it's something to think about because I'm not perfect, obviously. Like, I struggle with this, too, as well. And I wrote, I've said this before in a way. I've said, Lord God, help me over and over again, feeling helpless in some way, shape, or form. There's faith that God exists there in that moment. So when I am going through a moment where I'm like, Lord God, help me, within that moment, there is faith that God exists because otherwise I wouldn't be turning to him. But the faith that he will help me in that particular situation, I cannot say that that's there. And obviously because I wouldn't be asking the question if I had faith that he would help me in that particular situation. And I said, I can't say that that's always there. Definitely something to make me think. And it's definitely something to make you think about because why isn't faith there in that particular moment? Um, I wanna make sure that I'm recording. Okay, cool, it's recording. Um, sorry, I got a text message, guys. Oh, my sister just sent me something funny. Um, and the question really is, guys, like, why isn't faith there in that particular moment? Why, why do we have faith that God exists when it comes down to problems that we may have or needs that we may want to want to be filled? we struggle with believing that he's going to meet those needs, but we do have the faith that he exists, guys. So that is kind of really something to make me think. And I really want to point this out to you guys because I want you to think about it too. I want you to think about all the times that you maybe needed something or you wanted God to come through for you, but you lack the faith that he would do it. You lack the faith that he would meet your needs. And his word actually tells us that we should not worry about what we need and actually just wrote that in my, um, I actually just studied that in my Bible because I have to always go back to that again. And actually even better, I have a Bible gateway right now, so Give me a quick second. I'm going to just pull that up on my little gateway. Um, so, wait. Worry about food scripture. I just want to, I, I know it's in the book of Matthew. Matthew 625, there it is. And usually I wouldn't share this with you, but I want you guys to um, kind of follow along with me here. And I hope that you guys can see my screen. Okay. Cool. So here's what it says. It says, be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people 
not that's not what I want to read. I want to read this one. Okay. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the sky. Don't they don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they are? Who among you by worrying can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Notice how the lilies in the field grow. They don't wear themselves out with work and they don't spend cloth. But I say to you that even Solomon in all of his splendor wasn't dressed like one of these. If God dresses grass in the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow, it's thrown into the furnace, won't God do much more for you, you people of weak faith? Therefore, don't worry and say, what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear? Gentiles long for all these things. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. Instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and righteousness, God's righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So when in this passage, in this piece of literature, in the book, God's Trial by Fire, Wood, Hand, Stubble, <laughs> he mentions a believer in Christ should not be with Lord, save me forever on his lips, coexisting with Lord, I believe, because it's very double-minded. We're saying two things at once that don't make sense. Are we going to say, Lord, we believe and we trust you? Or are we going to say, Lord, save me? Because they mean two completely different things. If we if we tell God that we believe him, we should also believe that he's going to take care of all of our needs. If we focus on him, all the rest of it is going to be taken care of. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God in Matthew chapter six, and all of these things will be added on to you. So I really want to just point that out, guys. And I highlighted it in this book, and I encourage you to get it because I want you to think about the times where you have needed something and instead of focusing on God in that moment you focused on that need more than the provider you focused on the creation more than more than the creator you made an idol and we can we can make idols out of things that we need for an example if I really need water like I have water right here like let's just say for an example if I really need water and um I don't have any water. If I focus all of my energy on water, I'm just going to consistently want water. I'm just going to want it even more. But if I focus on my, all of my energy on the life, the person who is the well, the, the person who is the, um, the living water himself, I'm going to receive water. Hopefully that makes sense, guys. So I thought I can really just keep pulling more and more out of it, but I want you guys to think about that because I had to think about that myself too. There are times where I am really just thinking more about my problem versus the problem solver, guys. And if we say, like he said here, Lord, I believe, then we shouldn't even be, we shouldn't ever come to this place where we're saying, Lord, save me. We should know that you know, he's always going to leave the 99 for the one. He's always going to leave, again, the 99 for that one sheep. I want to give you guys a reference for that scripture because I wrote it in, in the beginning of my Bible. Give me a quick second. I feel like whenever I need to reference something for you guys, I never have it handy. I, um, that's crazy. Like I, okay, well, I'm going to find it online. <laughs> okay. So that's Matthew 18, chapter 18, verse 12. Okay, so again, that's, and I think I, I prefer in some cases going with the KJV because it's a lot better. Um, okay. So Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 12 says, 
how think you if a man has has a hundred sheep and one of them is gone astray does not he say you know does not he leave the 99 and go to the mountains and seek that which is gone astray guys god will always leave the 99 for you he will always leave the 99 for you and if you say lord i believe then you believe that if you're going through something he's going to do that for you well i thought that was pretty like definitely something to think about when it came to what walter had wrote on page four and um there was this is page five um where he talks about and i'll read this beginning part it says this the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord which is romans chapter geez i don't know the numbers you guys are going to be very patient with me here um, sorry y'all this is very new for me so you guys okay so that's romans chapter uh six verse 23 it says the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord the salvation proclaimed is a gift then before all else take it lay hold on eternal life and that's again, first Timothy chapter six, verse 12, that first. Afterwards, live up to it. May the Holy Spirit bring you now to the Redeemer, to the Father, who waited to be gracious. And then he says, this is Walter speaking, come to him as sinners, not hiding anything back and simply pleading Christ with merit. So for my notes, I wrote, meaning take all of my ugly sinful baggage and bring it to him the father honestly just the thought of this makes me feel bad and shameful and that's not god's love his love saves it's normal to feel shameful but it's okay and safe to give it over to god so how many times guys have you you know and i write these notes in here because i struggle with this as well i'm going to turn you up a bit to make sure you hear me okay <laughs> But how many times, guys, do you go through something that makes you feel really shameful or you maybe you have too much to drink or maybe you, you said something to someone that was kind of rude and you shouldn't have said it and you wish you could take it back or you've done something that you just felt God was not going to be or would not be as pleased with you or in your heart you knew it was wrong and you just feel so much shame and guilt around it. Like how many of you guys have done something that you just felt a lot of shame and guilt around it? And then instead of in that moment turning to God, you kind of ostrich it, right? Like you stick your head in the ground and you just kind of try to pretend that it didn't happen or pretend that it's over. But just more than anything within those moments, instead of turning to God, you turn away from God. You turn your face away from God and you wait until you feel righteous enough or holy enough to where you can stand before him again because you probably feel that if you were to stand before him or go to god or open up your um bible during that time and search the scriptures what god has to say about it like feel his heart on the matter you would feel crushed under your sin you would feel crushed under the shame and the guilt guys how many times have you felt that way well, that's the exact opposite of what God wants us to do in those moments. Those are the very moments that he wants us to turn to him. Those are the very moments that he wants us to put aside the shame, put aside the guilt and turn to him. And in fact, guys, when you feel that, when you feel shame and guilt, that is not from God. He did not give that to you. When you feel scared to come to him in those moments, God did not give you a, uh, the spirit of fear, but a power and a sound mind. And the sound mind and the Lord says, turn to him when you are facing trouble, because he is going to cleanse you. He's going to forgive you of your sins. Otherwise, he would have never sent his son to that on the cross for you. So in those moments, it is very important that you turn to him and seek him more than ever, guys. So let me know in the comments if you're someone who does that, if you're someone who, when you do something, when you feel like God wouldn't approve of it, it's not considered righteous, um, you feel this inkling to hide yourself from God or not turn to him, 
because you think that he's not he disapproves of sin so much and he hates it so much that he's not going to want anything to do with you and that's not true guys that's a lie from the enemy yes god hates sin but he loves you he loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you so in those moments because he hates sin and he loves you he wants to cleanse you and he wants to make you new again but he cannot do that if you don't turn to him in the moment where you feel low and you need him the most guys and it is religion that says that when you are in sin, God wants nothing to do with you. But it's a relationship and the love of God that says the exact opposite. The relationship that God wants to have with you and the love of God says that when you were in your darkest moments, when you were going through the lowest of the low, he's there with you. He will not leave you. So it's those moments that we need to turn to him because he's there. We just have to turn to him. And I just want to take you really quick to Psalms, it's Psalms chapter 23. And it's my first uh, favorite chapter in Psalms. And it says, by the way, this is why I love this book, guys, because it really helps you um, reference back to scripture. That's like really good. All right. All right. So um, that kind of actually gave you guys a little bit of time to flip the song. So um, yes, it's in the darkest moments, guys, where God is there with you and he's just waiting for you to turn to him. So I want to take you to Psalm 23, uh, Psalm chapter 23, verse four. And I'm going to actually go there with you. I have my physical Bible here, but I'm going to go there with you on Bible Gateway so you can see on my screen. 23, 4. And I love reading out of the KJV because it's the closest version to the actual um, Hebrew text, Hebrew and Greek text. Um, and then sometimes if I can't understand, if I really am having a hard time understanding the KJV version, then I will switch to the CEB, the Common English Bible. But for the most part, guys, I'm going to be quoting from the KJV. So um, Psalm chapter 23, verse four says, yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, thy comfort me. Guys, this scripture right here, I want you to write it down, stick it on your wall, stick it on your mirror, put it wherever you need to see it every single day, especially when you feel guilt or shame about something that you've done, because immediately, guys, the second you start to feel guilt or shame about something that you've done, that is the enemy trying to put you in bondage. He's trying to take your mind and put you in bondage. He's trying to wrap you in this ball of anxiety and thoughts and thinking about what you could have done differently or where you'd be now if you didn't do that. And guys, that is not God. Um, God does not remind you of your past. God brings you into the future. He steps into the now with you and pulls you into your future. The second you find yourself thinking about the past, meditating on the past, thinking about what you could have done differently, then you are not in alignment with God. And remember this scripture, Psalm chapter 23, verse four, where it says, yeah, I walk through the valley of shadow of death. I, that means you're going to be there. You're going to go through moments where, where it feels like you're in the valley of the shadow of death. You're in the lowest point you've ever been, the lowest place your soul has ever gone. And what is the soul, the mind, the emotions, and the will? The lowest place your mind has ever been, the lowest place your emotions are, have ever been, the lowest place your will has ever been, right? And God gave us free will, but if we are in control of that will to the point where we're doing things that we want to do that aligns with God's will, then you're in a very low place, your will. So yeah, though you walk through the shadow of the valley of death, the lowest place in your soul is then your, your mind, your will, and your emotions. You will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with you. Thou art with me. I rod in myself to comfort you. He's there to comfort you guys. So if you're feeling guilt and shame, um, then you need to turn to God because he's there to comfort you. It's not the time to um, hide from God, you know, and it's ac actually, that's what, and I want to give you guys ref scripture references. That's actually what 
we see in Adam and Eve do in the Garden of Eden and the book of Genesis, they hid from God. Meaning, you know, after they had sinned, after they ate from the tree that God told them not to eat from, their first, immediately when they ate from the tree that God told them not to eat from, that immediately pulled them into a covenant with the enemy. And that immediately pushed them, you know, into sin. And because of that, their mind started to think differently, guys, because their mind started to think differently. Their reaction, instead of running to their creator, they hid themselves. They hid themselves in the garden. And I want to take you there too. And I could really just go with this, but um, I could be on here all day, which is why I want to make this a series. So I think it's really important for you guys to stick with me because you're going to pull a lot out of it. Mm. I like to give you guys scripture references do you know give me a quick second okay so i want you guys to go with me to genesis chapter 3 verse 8 um And I want you guys to take note of this, okay? And this is what we do not want to do. So it says, Genesis, again, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, and it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, God amongst the trees of the garden. So what was their first reaction when they heard God walking, when the voice of God walking in the garden? Their first reaction, guys, was to hide themselves from God. And when you're a sinful being, when you have sinful nature, that is what your reaction is going to be. Your reaction is going to want to be to hide yourself from God because he's so holy and it's really crushing. It's really this helpless feeling when um, he wants to comfort you and you know that there's nothing you can do to make up for the fact that you have done something or that made you feel so guilty and shameful and that's okay guys because he already paid the price there's nothing you can ever do to make up for it so it's so much better for you to just lay it at his feet so i can go on and on with that um but i was able to pull out a ton from that one line where it says come to him as sinners not hiding anything back religion says come to god already righteous and he will accept you but god's relationship and love says come to him as sinners and I think it was Corey Asbury who sings um, Reckless Love of God. He mentioned, I think he mentioned something like, um, I think he said, heaven would rejoice, rejoice more over one sinner that turns to God versus like 40 righteous people that turn to God. And it's true <laughs> because if we were already righteous and if we had already had everything um, and we didn't need him, then it would make his son dying on the cross pointless right and so we want to come to him completely honest as sinners because that's what we are and allow what he did to cleanse us by accepting it cool so then there's this one as well where he said uh where, where walter said you cannot even pray acceptably acceptably that word <laughs> So the Holy Spirit moves you, but do not wait for such ruling. Pray now, come for pardon now. The Holy Spirit has moved you when you thus began. That you were sinners is not a hindrance. The knowledge of that fact is positively your best qualification. And this is so powerful, so astounding. Um, and I wrote, this very statement is powerful and will set a lot of people free. Heck, it made me feel like the weight lifted just reading it this very statement is the good news and it is because it says the very fact that you're sent that you're senders it's not a hindrance religion says that it is a hindrance religion says that sin separates you from god and at once upon a time that was true the wages of sin are death sin did separate us from god there was a veil but when jesus came and he died on the cross the veil was torn there is no separation because the sin is always going to be plain the moment we accept what he done for us on the cross. So whenever you feel that you've sinned or you feel guilt or shame for doing something that you've done, 
you come to him and you allow his spirit to cleanse you and make you new. And you just keep doing that over and over and over again, and over and over and over again, and accepting the good news. And that is the good news. And then, so again, the very fact that you are sinners is not a hindrance. The knowledge of that fact is positively your best qualifications. As you come to God and you're really humble and you come to him laying everything, all of your burdens, all of your shame, all of your guilt, your past, <clears throat> everything that you're anxious about, laying it at his feet and saying, God, I am a sinner and I know nothing without you. I am nothing without you. That qualifies you to be accepted into the kingdom of God knowing that does alone so don't let anyone trick you or deceive you into thinking that you have to be 100 percent righteous for god to accept you that's actually what the pharisees did in the day of jesus because he told them that he was coming to fulfill the law not get rid of it and they couldn't understand how something could be added to the law they couldn't understand the concept of faith because they didn't have the holy spirit then but now we do so there's a, there's a beautiful way to be accepted into the kingdom of God um, because the price is already paid. <clears throat> this is why I have water because I do a lot of talking and um, my voice gets a little hoarse. Perfect. Okay, so this one like this stood out with me as well it says let let each and again we're still on page five like i have been talking and we're like for a long time we're still only on page five so it says let each plea be this assuredly i am the chief of sinners but therefore i come christ came to call not the righteous but the sinners wow super powerful and i did a a little note on this i said this is so true sorry um have to burp a little bit so i said this is so true remember the pharisees thought when i was just talking about this i said this is so true remember the pharisees thought they were righteous but they were righteous by their own words not by by or through christ jesus because they rejected him and his truth believing that i'm righteous on my own by my works or any works that i do is essentially being that same as the early pharisees lean on jesus he is the only way so again guys there's nothing you could do in your own might and your own efforts to be considered righteous in god's eyes the only thing that you could do to be considered righteous in god's eyes is to merge your will with the words to submit your will to god's will and that way, all he's going to see when he looks at you, all the father is going to see is his son in you. Guys, um, so hopefully that makes sense. And let me know in the comments if you're someone who has been striving for this form of what you believe to be righteousness and you just feel tired, you just feel so tired, you feel like you're striving for something that is absolutely impossible and you feel like people are expecting you to be perfect especially religious people or so-called christians um you're striving for something that is actually unattainable it's something that even the early church um could not could not hold up to could not keep up to um this is why they could not hold up the law this is why jesus had to come guys so let me know if there's someone who is struggling with that we don't have to anymore. Okay. So then he then he goes on to say, my sins only prove about me that I am of the very ones to respond to the Savior's call and immediately. What prevents? Certainly not my sins. For without sin, I have no invitation to come to Christ. And I said, wow, let that sink in. Without sin, there is no need to come to Christ. His entire purpose is to save and give life. Without sin or death, there wouldn't be a need. And there's so many people on this earth who are, who are wanting to hide sin from God. And they're wanting to pretend like they're so righteous and so holier than thou. And it usually is the authority figures in the church. It usually is your pastors, your preachers, your bishops, your apostles, your prophets. Like these people who are pretending that they're so holier than thou. But here it is, the proof is in the pudding, the truth. For without sin, I have no invitation to come to Christ. Guys, these people, and it says in the book of Acts, it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I want to pull that out to you. 
I can know which one it was, but I'm pretty sure it was in the book. Uh, actually, it was Romans. But Romans is by Acts. So I'm pretty close to that one. Romans 3.23. It is the second. Okay, here it is in the book of Romans. It says, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. My video is a little glitchy. Um, so that lets us know right now, uh, right here, guys, it's in his word here in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means that the most, the people that you consider the most righteous and holier and thou, and you can do no wrong, and for sure they have a seat in heaven. Not so, says God's word. <laughs> they all have sinned, everyone, even they, even the person that you think is the most righteous, even your pastor, even your bishop, your apostle, your preachers, your prophets, they've all sinned all of them and they've all come short of the glory of god the only thing that could save them is christ jesus and if they believe that they're so perfect and holy they're thou then jesus says they're not worthy of him these are like the pharisees they're like modern day pharisees guys and i can pull so much out of that but i'd be here all day and we're only in page five and i may have to do i'm probably going to do a part two of this um, I'm probably going to go for the couple more minutes. Okay. So this is page, page six. Um, and then he says, I believe, I'm going to start here. I believe in Christ as the Lord, my only righteousness, my ample sufficiency, my complete justification. And that involves not that perhaps I may be, but that I am pardoned from this instant saved. There is therefore now no condemnation, and that's from Romans, and I do not know Roman numerals, but I'm going to have to pull that really quick, because I want to make sure I'm giving that to you right. Mm -hmm. Kind of like. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so that's Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Okay. Therefore, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. I have passed from death unto life. And I wrote, you passed, and this is you, this is you, believer, that the scripture is speaking about. You passed from one side of the looking glass into the other. And I say this, and I want to kind of um, give you a reference, reference from this. I was reading Robert Kiyos. Kiyosaki's retire young, retire rich. And he he really um he did like a, a visualization of life and of the kingdom. And the visual visualization was so profound because he uh related it to Alice to the looking glass, because Alice to the looking at glass, right? Like there was this entire world inside the looking glass, but she would have never known that if she had accepted through the looking glass and getting getting through the glass on the other side that's a challenge within itself because if you were to look in a mirror what do you see guys you see you looking back at you and it's a challenge to be able to look past yourself look past your problems look past your sins look past the flaws that you have and see an entirely different world the kingdom of god so that's kind of like a breakdown of where i got got this from so i said again this says, I have passed, this is again, Romans chapter eight, verse one. I have passed from death into life. And I said, if I can get it to stick, <laughs> you've passed from one side of the looking glass to the other, one side of the mirror to the other. Instead of looking in the glass, looking at you, looking at you, looking back at you, you step through the looking glass into an entire new world, which is the kingdom. You step into life. <clears throat> You step through the looking glass into life because once you fully traded your sins for acceptance of what Jesus did for you on the cross, you no longer see yourself in the mirror, your flesh looking back at you. You don't see that when you look in the mirror anymore. It's just dirt. It's simply flesh. You begin to see God. You begin to see an entire kingdom. Once you can reach through the looking glass and touch a tangible kingdom, an entire world you can be a part of now 
you can be a part of an entire world. This is why God says the kingdom of the kingdom of uh, God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is within you. It is to come and it is within you. You can access it now, guys. And that is stepping through doors and glass. When you are wanting to, <clears throat> and I want to give you guys like a, a little breakdown of more example of what I mean by that. Like when you're wanting to get to your promised land, when you're wanting to get to prosperity and wealth and the things that you believe you're supposed to have in this life, and all you can see on the other side of that is you. And I'm going to give you an example of what that's like. If all you can see is your desires, not God desires, your, um, because, you know, I, I think it's Genesis, the book of Genesis does tell us that our heart is desperately wicked, guys. So out of the heart comes our desires. And if we haven't allowed God to make a home within our heart, then all we have is the wickedness that's in our heart. So yeah, it's uh, Genesis chapter eight, verse 21, where it says, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So it tells us from the beginning that our heart is desperately wicked. It's, it's evil. So if we are looking into our future and we're saying here are the things that we want and all we can see is things looking back at us that are us, like our own insecurities. So to say for an example, if you in your future, you want the big flashy, big fancy stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course, because God will give you that as he sees fit and he sees that you need it to advance his kingdom. But if you're only wanting those things because maybe you didn't have it as a child and you want to show other people that you can be fancy or have fancy things, that's an insecurity. So you're looking into your future and you're seeing yourself. You're seeing your flaws. You're seeing things that you lack, not things that you already have. And I could do a whole training on this, guys, but I want you to just kind of sit on that and chew on it. You may have to go back and rewind this video and really just kind of like listen to me say that again and sit on that. Um, but when you look on the other side of your life right now, you should not see yourself looking back at you. You should see God. You should see the future that God has for you. You should see the hope and the vision that he has for you. Because he does tell us that he has... Um, plans for us and he has hope for us um but he has plans for us you know he doesn't adopt our plans that we have for ourselves and say i'm going to give you that no he has his own plans for us and i'm going to pull up that scripture so i can take you there um because i'm really horrible with remembering scriptures jeez what was that verse uh, Matthew 6, verse 10. Let me see if that was it. That was not it. So I'm sorry I can't pull everything off Google. Oops. Oh, I think it's uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm backwards a little bit. I'm really hard. I'm really bad at this. Okay. So again, we want to take on God's plans for our life and not try to impose our plans that we want for our life on him because he's never going to bend to our will. Never. He's, it, it's going to either take a lot of, he will allow us to go through a lot of hardships until we've reached a point so low in our life where we say, we have no other choice but to say, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. And this is because in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, he says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And that's the King James Version. And I think it's worded a little bit differently in the context on the English Bible. You guys are being so patient with me. If you made it this far in the video, comment that you made it this far. Cool. So it's uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the common English Bible version. It says, I know the plans that I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster to give you a future filled with hope. And so here he is saying, I know the plans that I have in mind for you. He doesn't say 
I know the plans that you have in mind for you. And it's because we are expected to bend to his will, not our will. And his plans are glorious plans, of course. He says, if you were evil and you give good gifts to your children, you know, what more than me, you know, being, you know, God would give gifts to you. And I know that I'm butchering that verse, so I'm going to find that one too. That's Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. Okay, and it says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will, have, will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask him? Right. So just remember that. That's that's a lot to, to think about, guys. You know, not our will, but his. And we have to trust that he has really good things that he wants to give us, you know. And I always kind of imagine it where... Um, you know, like we're, you're driving in a car and you're driving in a car on this really dark, dirt, deserted road, road and it's dark outside and you're driving and you've got, <clears throat> you push God in the passenger seat and you push him in the passenger seat under this assumption that you know where you're going, but you're lost and you are having a really hard time and you can't see and you don't know where you are, but you refuse to let God take over the driver's seat. And he's just constantly saying, let me take over the driver's seat. I know where we're going. It's okay. It's a challenge to park the car, get out, and let him sit in the driver's seat. And it's also a challenge to not know where you're going, but to trust him fully that he's taking you somewhere great. He's taking you somewhere safe. He's taking you somewhere um, that he knows you love, guys. And usually that is your promised land. That is your promised land. But one, it's going to be dark. It's going to be a long ride. The roads are rocky. It's going to be rocky. It's going to be a hard ride, guys. Remember what it was like as the Hebrews were going through the wilderness. It's always going to be a wilderness, but he's going to be there with you in the wilderness. He was there with the Hebrews. He was there by fire by night and cloud by day. I think I said that right. He's going to be with you in your, your wilderness season. Just remember that. So, and it's because once you pass from death unto onto life it is a journey right there cool so i'm gonna go over this one i'm gonna end it and then i'll see how you guys like these to see if i'm gonna do a second one and finish up so then uh walter goes on to say my brother let not the magnitude of sin thus make you doubt the full efficacy of christ's atonement when it is a question of safety, look off from self and up to Christ. And I wrote, as a reference to the looking glass, stop looking at me, looking at me, looking back at me, look beyond the glass and see Christ, God, his kingdom. Because if you don't look beyond the looking glass, all you'll ever see is you. All you'll ever see is you looking back at you. You'll never get to that place in life where God wants you to be. You'll always be stuck going around in a circle wondering why you can't get the things that you want in life. And it is likely because you're trying to get to the things that you want in life, not the things that God wants for you in life. So that, I just wanna leave you with that to think about. Um, I've got people who are texting me. So yeah, I'll leave you with you. I'll leave you guys with that to think about. I, I felt like, this was really great. And again, I'm going to try to leave the link below in the description. If I forget for some reason, because I usually do, put it in the comments below so I can remember to leave the link there for you guys to read the book for yourself. And then it'll be even more interactive because we can kind of talk about in the comments what you guys have pulled out of it. Um, and it'll be more, more fun that way. So let me know in the comments if you guys enjoyed this, if you want the part two to it, because I'm on page 70 right now. Um, and I pulled so much more out of this book. But let me know if you guys want to see more like this with other religious texts or Christian books. And this also, like, if you just don't want to read the book, but you want to know what I got out of it, and um, you just feel like there's little things here and there that can help you in your journey, comment that below too, because you don't have to read the entire book. You can just kind of listen to my commentary on it, on what I got out of certain passages. So cool. Love to know what you guys think of this and what you guys pulled out of this in the comments below and also don't forget to subscribe guys because 
um, when you subscribe, it's not, it's not for me just wanting to see my number go up. It's so that these messages and these videos can get out to as many people who need to see them and need to listen to them. These people are going through really hard times right now. And these messages could save someone's life. It could help someone get saved. It could encourage them in a moment when they're down and bring them into the house of God, Lord, uh, of God, guys. So um, subscribe, share these videos if you want to. Um, I encourage you guys to share actually so that more people can see this. And I love you guys. And I will talk with you there in the comments.